we'll go on to uh, Jim Cornette then. Um, before we sure. talk about the fallout and the video camera in the car and et cetera, yep. um, talk about what you learned from Jim Cornette, which I imagine is a lot. Uh, yes, so uh, what you learned from Jim. Well, in hindsight now, and like I said, we're 30 years. I mean, I was 22 then. I'm 51 now. A lot of time has gone by. Initially, I just learned to shut up and listen. You know, that's what they always tell you. Just shut up and listen. Be respectful. Be polite. Don't be a goof. Don't be a mark. Don't try and be too insider. You know, don't, don't try and use, you know, too insider lingo. Um, Jimmy, what I, what I appreciated as an employee of Jimmy's was his detailed organization is like second to none, even for anyone I've ever worked to to this day. You know, Jimmy has notes and records and, and, and knows where everything is and where everything's going. So I learned to be organized from him. Um, and then just watching how he layered things. You know, sure, he could have the baby face in jeopardy and have another baby face run out to help him. But wouldn't it be more fun if a couple heels came out first? And then he just kept layering for heat. And then I think the way, like I would sit in our production meetings before the TV tapings, and what he would tell Bob and Dutch, cover this point, definitely, you know, these are your three bullet points. And so how he just explained to the announcers what he wanted to get over, you know, this is how I want you to tell the story. And then work watching him work with wrestlers, and, and you can see them just accepting his vision when he's laying it out and how he laid it out. So it all made sense. There was never anything that Jimmy said that you could step back and go, well, that's not real logical, or other than the money. <laughs> other than the money. But everything he'd book, he's like, well, that's pretty logical. That makes sense. That's Yeah, I can see that. And so I think that was it, just the, the organization, the attention to detail, and don't leave any gaps, either in your booking or your organization. Just don't leave gaps. And uh, the question I'd probably ask more than anything else in relates, uh, when it relates to Jim Cornette is the – most memorable time he blew a gasket over something very minor. Fuck, take your pick. Take your pick. <laughs> well, you can um, give us 10 if you like. I, I would think the worst one I ever saw, when we would do our TV tapings, we would, like someone would be sitting here like me in front of a little monitor with headset on. He was the stage director. He was the liaison between the, produ uh, the director in the truck and Jimmy. Jimmy standing behind him. This poor kid named Tim once. Whatever he did, they got it wrong in the truck and they missed it. <clears throat> they missed the angle, they missed the ending, they missed the camera shot, something. <clears throat> this poor guy, who I don't even know if he's a wrestling fan. He worked for the production company. He was just there to help produce the show. I don't even know if he knew shit about wrestling. But Jimmy, I don't... It was one of the most spectacular, colorful, um, without taking a deep breath, just promos that he cut on this guy. Just ripped him a new one up and down. Uh, that one was pretty impressive. He usually, um, he didn't do that to Brian very often because Brian, you know, Brian was okay. Um, Jimmy saved that, those outbursts for people who couldn't respond. It was almost, and I, and I say this because I, 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 in endearing ways, it was almost an abuse of power on his part. You know, you, you pick on the guy that can't fight back because he won't talk back. And that's how, you know, so it was the, it was the parking lot attendant. It was the girl at the drive through. It was the poor stage director. It was the guy at the rental car counter. Those are the ones he really saved his big verbal diatribes for. Did you uh, ever see, and you must have seen it at least once or twice where Jimmy would be accosted by a fan or something like that. And Jimmy would take matters into his own hands. Oh, there was just the one, well, not just the one, but probably the most well-known was this night in a town called Wise, Virginia. And it was just a, it was a college gym. So you walk out one end of the bleachers for the heels, the other end of the bleacher locker room for the baby faces. Well, their college wrestling team sat on the archway over the heel dressing room. And they were just mocking the heels as they came out. And then I think some kid took a swing at Jimmy at the rib side. And the N-word got dropped. I don't know if it was Jimmy Del Rey or Jimmy Cornette who said it, but then all of a sudden we're in this huge brawl. Uh, these guys start jumping out off the rafters. The baby face is clear out of their side. Heels clear out of our side. They're going like Tracy and white boy are back to back. So they'd just been fighting in the ring. Now they're fighting off all these college kids, these tough college wrestlers who are mocking the show. And then word gets out. Somebody got a knife. I ran and dove and I got that guy I dove and grabbed him. 
but it was just ugly. The cops came. We all had to get an escort out of town. But that was the one. By then, people weren't swinging at Jimmy so much. They knew the legend of the racket, even up there in the hills. I think that was a lot more in Mid-South. Um, yeah, they would heckle him and stuff, but nobody ever jumped the rail or anything like that. I, I uh, bring it up because uh, Charles Warrington, head banger Mosh, said he actually saw it himself. But this was after, uh, this was in 95, obviously in the last few months. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll go on to, I suppose, what we call the main event then. So when did the relationship sour between you and Jim and the car incident video camcorder. And uh, b- before you start, you also said that Jim Cornette's obviously said his version of it. Uh, you tell me where you right. disagree with his version. So the only the only thing is he he had, when he and I got back in contact in 2016, Jimmy and I had not spoken since '94. Uh, when the Smoky Mountain homeless shelter burned down, I sent him pictures. We started talking again, and he did a podcast uh, about the incident that happened with us. And I had people on Twitter going, "Is that really how it happened?" The one thing I'm most proud of when it did happen, Dave Meltzer put in the Observer, because I told him my side and Jimmy's told him his side. Dave said, I've never had this in wrestling where people had a fight and both told the exact same story. <laughs> so I was always proud. Like, I was honest. I always felt like Jimmy's really honest. I was never like that when Jim Ross says, you know, Paul Heyman and Jimmy Cornette are like one of the same. Like, Paul Heyman's a fucking liar about everything. Jim Cornette is not a liar. I'll say that. Like, he remembers things amazingly to detail. So anyway, um, we have the uh, summer of 94. The official end of it all was uh, right around the time of the Night of Legends in August. But what had happened when Jimmy moved out, when Delray moved out in April, Delray and I were really close, like brothers. We stayed in touch for years. That was kind of hard on me. And then seeing the people leave, and then the houses going down, and then they're talking on the national news about a steroid trial and ring boys being molested in New York. And... The business was just at its, I mean, just at the bottom, you know, it didn't bounce back to what spring of 96 when Scott Hall showed up on Nitro, Mm -hmm. but business was really bad. And I was souring James. I was tired of fighting for the money. When I, when I came in, when I started my enthusiasm for wrestling was here, my need for money and caring about anything else was here over the two years. I stopped. I just, I didn't see my place in it. I was like, I don't see myself as a wrestler. I don't see this. The things you have to do to survive, and I know you like the Brian Lee story, the story of the sponsors and getting an old housewife who will pay your phone bill, <laughs> but don't sleep with her. Brian Lee, that was his advice to him. He's like, brother, get your sponsor. You need a sponsor. They'll pay your bills and you don't have to worry about it. I just wasn't comfortable with that morally, ethically. And well, so it's I easy lost to it. get a sponsor if you're on TV as a featured wrestler as well and you know you gain fans, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I didn't have problems with that. Brian would say, oh, here. Here's old Betty. She's 50 year old, lonely housewife. She'll, you know, <laughs> Brian had a whole cast of them in every <laughs> town. He had a sponsor. And so that, but that's what they're telling me I have to do to survive. And I just, it's like, I'm tired of fighting for the money. We did a famous angle, great angle, a parking lot angle where the heavenly body supposedly under ski mask jumped Chris Jericho and, and Lance Storm beat him up in the parking lot. It was actually Rex and Steve Dahl under mask because Tom and Jimmy were working for New York. But uh, and Steve Dahl grabs Lance, bounces his head off my car about four times. I got a big old dent in my car. I come up to Corny and I said, "Yo," and he's like, "Oh, that was a rib." I'm just like, "Really? Like that's the first new car I've ever bought. I drive a thousand miles a week for you, and then you bang it up in some angle and you blow me off." So I was losing interest, James, and I just thought, "I'm not happy." Um, he was always trying to take the tapes away from me, which were a source of income. But also, like I said, we're this anchor because I could never leave the house to do my other work, to get away from it. And it just, I was just done. And so we have this blow up. Um, you know, I, I, I screwed up. I mean, it was on me. And I, it, what it was, James, is it's like a breakup when you stay too long. You know, you ever break up with a girl and you're like, hey, I think we should break up. I do too. Okay, stop talking. Take your shit and leave. Yeah, and no, you no clean break. The, the, right. Yeah, exactly. Cold we turkey. stayed. Yeah, we stayed too long in the breakup. And I should have just left. I should have been like, I'm unhappy, Jimmy. I'm going home. Instead, I tried to hang on. I was trying to keep the job going. I was, you know, trying to do my part. And I just, I just lost interest. And I was tired of not making any money. And I just said, there's other things I want to do. The business is going downhill overall, not just here, but like. 
it, it was just it was depressing and like the the rats were getting off the ship tim was going pam was going and i just thought jimmy del rey was gone he was my closest friend um i loved bruiser but you know i just it wasn't enough and so jimmy to his credit did everything he could jimmy was my biggest advocate sandy scott was on my ass all the time grumpy old man jimmy defended me as long as he could and then finally we had our blow up and and I just wanted money that I was owed. <laughs> That's all I want. Just so I could have enough gas money to leave town. Because again, I'm making $150 a week. And I had put out money and expenses and I just wanted to be reimbursed. Did I handle that correctly? I don't know. You know, I probably, in hindsight, I went to two guys. Dr. Tom, who was like wrestling Yoda. Because you couldn't understand a thing he said. I love Tom, but he spoke in, back then he was in a very dark place and he spoke in riddles. He wasn't this great teacher that everybody knows. I look at Tom Pritchard, I'm like, that's not the Tom I know. <laughs> Tom would speak to you in riddles and leave you to figure it out. I'm like, what does that mean? Tom said, Don't bug Jimmy for your money. I'll send you some money to get out of town. Don't he's under too much stress. Don't do it. Okay. The other one I called, and Jimmy's talked about this. People always try to figure out who said this. I taught another wrestler and he said, Get your money. Don't let him fuck you on the money. Get your money. If he owes you money, get your money. Do what you have to do. Work out a trade for that camera. Okay. Now is, um, now, is this wrestler going to remain anonymous throughout? No, no. It was Robert Gibson. Okay. Robert, Robert Gibson of the Rock and Roll Express was my sensei. He took me under his wing right away. He found out I was one of the Greensboro guys that had booed him out of the Greensboro Coliseum for years. He's like, kid, I love you. You're with me. So Robert Gibson told me, get your money. And so I did. And he wasn't being mean to Jimmy or being just, but he just said, you know, if you're going to be in this business and they owe you money, you better get it or they'll screw you every time. And, uh, and so I probably pushed that a little, I was baiting Jimmy with wanting that money and we had our blow up and everything he says and his, I mean, if you want to hear the whole thing, God, listen to one of his podcasts. He's so good with details. He remembers it exactly. But yeah, the bottom line was the company owed me money. He didn't want to pay me. He said, oh, you cost me that in aggravation. Okay. And there was some back and forth about, are you going to pay me? Or are you not going to pay me? And It was just a bad, I look at it now in hindsight as a bad breakup. Because I don't dislike Jimmy. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't. I, I can't dislike someone who did that much for me. I feel bad I stayed as long as I did. And I should have left earlier when I was unhappy that it got to the point where it did because I knew Jimmy was under so much stress. And, you know, people have to remember Jimmy was only 32 years old. You know, I don't know how old you are, James, but you know, 32, you're you, younger than me. I'm 34. So, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, you know, Jimmy wasn't very emotionally mature to handle a lot of that stuff. Cause he was just very bombastic, you know, cause that's what he learned from Watts. You know, his dad died when he was a kid. I think Watts was his sole male influence. And Watts was big and loud, so Jimmy thought he had to be big and loud to chew everybody's butt. And you start feeling invincible when you hang out with wrestlers. That was the other thing I noticed. When I was palling around with Bruiser, canine all the time, well, all of a sudden you walk in a place, you start to feel like, yeah, I got a loaded gun here. And I think Jimmy thought he was probably a little tougher than he was being around all those wrestlers, but so he could be loud like that. And um, well, But I, I, I'm sure he's mellowed over the years, I hope, for his sake. Well, uh, uh, can I ask then, uh, what was the... Yeah. F- so obviously... The car's destroyed. Did you end up suing him? Did you go to the police or did you just sort of accept so, it? No, no, no. Well, it was it became a criminal thing then. Hmm. I mean, he destroyed the car. You want to see pictures? Uh, yes. Um, of course, nobody's ever seen these before. These <laughs> no. have never been I've never I had to dig these out of an old envelope. Um, I called the cops because it's happening in front of my neighbors and they're looking at me. So I called the cops. Jimmy was gone by then. They took the report. The newspaper called the next day, and I said, I don't want to talk to you. And they said, you can tell us your side, or we'll print what we want. I know Jimmy thinks I went to the paper and ratted out and was uh, looking for celebrities. Like, no, no. The only reason I spoke to him is they said, you can talk to us, and we'll tell it your way, or don't talk to us, and we'll tell it our way. So I at least wanted to get the story straight. Um, so let's see. That was my Cars 1. Okay. Um. Here's the side and back window all bashed out. There's a better, maybe a little better. So the windows ended up getting the uh, brunt of it then. Oh, yeah. All the windows were gone. I mean, the windshield was caved in. So, you know, my only regret about that, James, is when he came to get the video camera, 
I should have had the damn thing set up and rolling. If I could have recorded him smashing my car, I could have sold that tape to the tape traders for years. I could have made a fortune. <laughs> it would have been, a, U- have made it a, been a YouTube hit like the Dairy Queen thing. Uh, right has been away. For years. But before, even, yeah, years before Dairy Queen, that would have been. Can you imagine if I'd had that? Because he did. <laughs> he just walked around, bam, bam, bam. But like I said, I baited him. I knew what I was doing. My thought was I thought he'd get mad and just throw me the 350 bucks and walk away. But he didn't. And so it became a criminal thing. And I, I just I wanted I obviously wanted to be reimbursed for the nineteen hundred dollars worth of damage you did to my car. And then there was the uh, the the money that I felt like I was owed for expenses. And then while it was at the body shop getting the windows replaced, I said, Hey, that big dent in the back that looks like Lance Storm's face. Yeah, pop that out and put that on Jim's bill too. <laughs> so that was my one bit of karma. If you've ever seen Jimmy talk about when his car got trashed in 1997 an with the Nation of Domination and DOA, I know exactly what you mean. Correct. Brian Lee, my boy. My mm-hmm. boy, Brian. Well, here's Jimmy. And if you've ever heard Jimmy talk about it or Bruce Pritchard, and so to me, that was instant karma. It's like, oh, you don't like it when somebody pulls a rib on you and damages your stuff. And you had to drive home in the freezing cold. And so there was a little stinker part of me that's like, you know, Neener, neener, Jim. Now you know how it feels. That's that's karma. So, and Jim actually went on TV. He did commentary for Shotgun after that happened, and he kept referring to his car getting broken all the way through it as yeah. well. So, yeah. 